Hi, Dad. Uh, I'm making this video on Saturday morning. And we still don't have uh, a winner declared in the national election. It looks like Biden's going to win, uh, but they're slowly counting all the mail-in ballots now, and uh, we don't know when they're going to be finished. Um, it turns out there are many state races that haven't been called yet for either candidate, but uh, Biden is ahead in four of them, and a whole bunch of combinations of victories for him in those states will get him over the Electoral College uh, requirement of, of 270 votes. So, for example, he's ahead in Pennsylvania, and if he wins that, then he'll win the presidency. Um, or uh, he's ahead in Arizona and Nevada and Georgia, and if he wins any two of those, then, uh, then he will also be over. Uh, and of course, Trump's only answer to all this is his usual bluster in his answer. He blames other people. Uh, he makes baseless claims about voter fraud. Uh, his team has sued, I think, or started like, like 10 different suits and ch legal challenges so far, and nearly all of them have been uh, refused by the courts. Uh, at the end of the day, I think there'll be recounts and there'll be legal challenges that will go up to the Supreme Court. I think I'm going to call it the Supreme Red Court from now on. Uh, even those recounts and rulings aren't going to be enough, I think, to stop Biden from winning. So uh, we're all waiting and waiting and letting it play out for now. We're crossing our fingers uh, that it'll be over very soon and uh, that it'll be positive for uh, the Democrats. So. Meanwhile, uh, coronavirus is still here. Uh, coronavirus infections are rising and uh, rising into the winter, and they're the worst they have ever been for the country. Uh, yesterday, we had the highest number of confirmed infections so far. There were more than 125,000 infections yesterday, um, confirmed ones anyway, and it doesn't look like it's slowing down at all. Uh, I'm sure we're in for a rough and, and isolating winter. Uh, that'll be tough. I'm still hoping, though, that uh, after this winter, there'll be so many infections that the problem will begin to slow down by next summer um, and that we'll have uh, some treatments that will help to suppress the, the viral load of the, of the virus. You know, maybe there'll be a vaccine, but even if not, maybe they'll have some combination of medicines uh, uh, and, and uh, viral load uh, inhibitors or something so they can control the seriousness of the illness and we can all get back to a more normal life. Uh, otherwise, I think we're in for another tough 18 months. So, uh, you know, this rise in coronavirus cases will probably affect our ability to visit you in person. So we're going to have to see what happens there and, and play it by ear. So right now, we think that you're scheduled to, uh, to leave the hospital and go back to Newbridge on Monday. That's really good news, I think. They finally did that PEG procedure for you. Uh, they did it yesterday, and I know it's uncomfortable and a bit painful, and they've given you some meds to dull the pain and uh, that those make you sleepy, but uh, I'm guessing that this is better than that horribly annoying uh, tube that was up your nose. So it's something to get used to for sure, but uh, at least you'll be able to start to be mobile soon, and you can start your rehab at Newbridge and... Uh, uh, it'll be awesome to get you out of that hospital for sure. We want you out of that hospital. So we're going to see what they say when it comes to the transfer back to Newbridge and what the visiting rules are and whether you'll still be in quarantine and all that stuff. And, you know, once we know those rules, then uh, I'll be able to make some plans to come down and to say hi. Um, we went out to dinner last night uh, at a new restaurant. It was uh, the four of us. It was Jake and Ilana and Beth and, and, um, and, and, uh, and me. And, you know, we only go to restaurants that have outdoor seating so that we can socially distance and so that we're not in a, in a closed space that has uh, the potential to have uh, unfiltered, you know, stale, non-ventilated coronavirus air. So uh, this was a fresh restaurant. We've, uh, we've never been there before. And uh, it was in Norwalk and we sat outside, but this particular place didn't have any heaters. So it was a bit chilly after a while. Uh, I think by the time we ended, I, I was a little, a little chilled. It was about 59 degrees, I think, when we ended. But the food was pretty good. Uh, Jake had a, a, a mussel dish as an appetizer that he tried, which he really liked a lot. Uh, it was in the French style, uh, so it came with very nice uh, herbs and, and, and a sauce and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, and it came with French fries, and I had some uh, of the French fries too, and, and some of the, uh, a couple of the mussels, uh, and uh, they were delicious, but I definitely shouldn't have eaten that fried food. Uh, Jake had some bronzino for the main course. Uh, Ilana had a salad as an appetizer, and uh, she split that with Beth, and uh, Ilana had salmon for the main course, and uh, Beth had bronzino for the main course, and I had a beet salad, 
as an appetizer and uh, chicken breast for my main course. And uh, we got sides of, of mushrooms and uh, those were really, really good. Uh, and and uh, also so a cauliflower side dish that was also pretty good. Um, so the kids ordered some profiteroles for dessert. It, uh, three of them came. They were really, uh, they, they looked really, really good. Uh, Beth and Jake and Ilana ate them. I was very strong. I didn't eat any, especially after having those French fries. So overall, French fries. Overall, I'd say it was pretty good, even though uh, the wine choices were not that good. But Jake had a couple of mixed drinks that he really liked. So overall, we'll give it a thumbs up. Um, Jake has three job offers now, uh, although we're still waiting for official term sheets from two of them. The two where he's waiting for details are Amazon and Uber. And the one where he has uh, a tentative term sheet uh, is for a, a, a three-year-old data consultancy place in Boston, actually. And for, for that one, uh, it's a group of people that worked for uh, BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, which is a very, very well-known and uh, very respected consulting group. I think after McKinsey and Bain, this is the other one that's really very, very well-respected. Uh, and these guys uh, were part of their, their data group, and they split off to start this venture a few years ago. And so now I think it has around 30 people. It's still growing, and it looks really uh, interesting, although it's a little risky because it's new. Um, so it, it, it's probably, uh, you know, you never know what's going to happen over the next few years with a startup, but it looks like uh, it looks like it could be, a, you know, a really good opportunity. Uh, it's the one where where he gets the broadest opportunity to learn new and, and different things because he'd be consulting for a lot of different companies and trying, I think, a lot of uh, uh, different sorts of techniques and bolstering techniques and skills uh, that uh, for, for these uh, different analyses, um, and and that's uh, you know a bit different for from the other companies because they tend to pigeonhole you in very certain you know for Amazon and Uber maybe they tend to pigeonhole you in certain types of analyses just because of the department that you're in and uh, the kinds of jobs or, or projects that you get. So um, my guess is that the Boston job is the one that would actually pay the least. Uh, but it's certainly in the ballpark of what he would get paid at Amazon or Uber, so it's not uh, a complete lowball. And uh, the Uber offer should come early next week, and so we'll know more about the title and the pay there. Jake's really focused on the title because uh, he's pretty adamant that he wants to be hired as a data scientist rather than a data analyst at Uber. That's a different title structure and a different path that they have there. Um, uh, and in fact, if they only offer him that data analyst path, I don't think he's going to take that job. Uh, and then there's Amazon that has offered Jake a job, but they are still actually, they've offered him a job as a data scientist, and uh, uh, they are uh, still actually looking for exactly which team to place him with, so they, uh, there's still some uncertainty there, and that's why he hasn't gotten a term sheet there, because we don't quite know exactly what the job is. It's a little strange, but that's the way it is. So the Uber job would be in San Francisco, the Amazon, Amazon job would be in Seattle, and uh, uh, the data consultancy job would be in Boston. So a lot of fun choices for him to make. And quite frankly, uh, in this really bad economic environment, uh, with the influence of the coronavirus slowing down so much of the economy, um, I'm pretty relieved that he's fortunate enough to have so many great choices. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, the Boston Red Sox just announced last night that they rehired Alex Cora as their manager. So apparently his uh, suspension has now been served and his cheating transgressions uh, have been forgiven and he's back with the Red Sox. So we'll see how that goes. Meanwhile, I think the Pats play uh, uh, the Jets tomorrow. Uh, can, can you just imagine how embarrassing it's going to be if we lost to the Jets? Because the Jets, I think they're 0-7 or something like that. Um, I'm sure you'll probably be able to watch that on TV if you want. I hope you have a TV in your room. Uh, in, in, uh, I, I think you do. So um, I have one more story for you before I start to play classical music for you. So um, uh, Rocky recently had a little problem with his front elbow because he sort of, he actually dislocated his front right elbow a little bit when he was playing. Uh, he made some sharp turn and came up lame. Um, turned out to be nothing serious, and uh, when I brought him to the vet, they took x-rays, and uh, they had previously popped it into place, and they saw nothing uh, uh, that was really out of, uh, out of whack and nothing broken, so um, he had to take a little easy for a while, but at that time, the vet told me that he had gained too much weight, 
and that was a little bit of a surprise to me. He's got a lot of fur, and so it covers his weight. And he didn't seem all that hefty to me, that he'd gained uh, actually about, about seven pounds since he'd last been there. So he was at 30 pounds, which is really, uh, you know, uh, the, the largest size that you want a corgi to be, a corgi male. You want them to be between 25 and 30 pounds. Um, and, and so he, he was a little lighter, and I'd rather have him be about 26 pounds, something like that. Um, so she wanted us to cut back on his food. So that's no problem for me, and we started to do that. But meanwhile, his stomach ha has been really bad for a few weeks. So he's had, you know, very loose poops, and I've been trying to get a handle on, um, you know, controlling this. And we use our usual method, which is to give him a sort of a special dry dog kibble as his food. And that has always done the trick to stabilize him or stabilize Alfie in the past. It's always, it's always worked. But this time, it really hasn't been working. So I was thinking that very soon I was going to go have to take him back to the vet to see if he had some bad bacteria or something where he would need some medicine. But I hadn't taken him back to the vet yet for his stomach. So meanwhile, two days ago, I was doing my usual run on the treadmill. And that's also the room where I keep all the food for the cats and the dogs. I keep the food in big plastic bins with strong covers on them so there's no danger that mice can get to them or that, you know, the cats and, and dogs will want to, you know, pull off the cover and eat them. There's really no danger of that. Um, and I also kept um, one unopened big bag of cat food, a 22-pound bag of cat food, uh, by the TV in that room, it, basically because I was too lazy to put it in the unfinished part of the basement. And um, I just made it convenient for myself so that the next time I ran out of cat food for the plastic bin, I had another bag of cat food right there that I was going to open and refill the bin. So I'm running and running and doing my usual five miles. And, and my perception, because I listen to music or I watch, uh, I watch the news, news coverage, and and my perception, you know, Rocky always keeps me company. He comes downstairs and he basically hangs out down there. And, and my perception finally, it, it dawns on me as he wanders around the room that he's been hanging out. He's been sniffing around the unopened bag of the cat food and that he's been, you know, it finally occurs to me that he's been there for a long time, like for, you know, many, many minutes and, and I can't see anything, but all of a sudden it dawns on me that maybe there's a hole in the cat food bag and maybe he's eating the cat food. And the reason I think there might be a hole in the cat food, it all of a sudden occurred to me in the cat food bag is because Jake's cat Maple actually chews holes through these food bags. She has even chewed holes through bags that contain litter. She doesn't eat the litter, but, but she chews holes in these bags. So I tell Rocky to get away from there, and he does, and he lays down, he waits for me to finish my run, and when I finish running, I go over to the bag, and sure enough, there's a small hole in the bag, it's about, you know, an inch and a half in diameter, and, uh, and I couldn't see it because it was next to the wall, and Rocky was eating the food there. And remember, this was a 22-pound bag of food that was unopened, it was unopened, and when I picked up the bag, it was two-thirds gone, only seven pounds of food left. So... I think the mystery has been solved. Um, I think Rocky's been eating that food for some weeks, and he's not only gained weight, but it's absolutely, you know, sort of destroyed his digestive tract. And, uh, you know, hopefully now that, uh, now that I figured this out, everything is going to get better. And uh, I will say that yesterday his stomach was better, and uh, this morning his stomach was better. And uh, I'm hoping that, that uh, then in, in another day or so, it'll be completely back to normal. And I'm crossing my fingers that, uh, that everything's okay. So now we'll see about that. But um, that was an interesting story. So today's classical music list, uh, it's a nice couple of hours of music. All the music is from um, uh, uh, Raphael's suggestions, and I put them in uh, the following order. First, I decided to go with a bunch of overtures. Um, I'm going to do three from Rossini. Uh, I'm going to include the Barber of Seville. <laughs> then I'll do two from Mendelssohn, including the Hebrides Overture. And last, I'll do uh, the Prometheus, Prometheus Overture by Beethoven. And after those overtures are finished, I'm going with uh, Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 17, and then uh, a Mozart Concerto for two pianos. And then last, I'm going with Haydn's Symphony Number no. 104. I hope they're okay. Uh, again, sorry for the advertisements that break in between those. So I love you. I'll talk to you soon. And I hope you're feeling uh, better today.